Whoa, what's up guys? Well, today we're talking about MCU Iceberg. And we're gonna deep dive right into it. We got theories like, what if Tom Cruise was Iron Man? Miscasting, everything Kevin Foggy and Josh Whedon and their relationship with Marvel and the drama that ensued. We talk about James Gunn, we talk about Edgar Wright. Man, we even talk about Mob Morales and who if he'll show up in Multiverse of Madness. There's a lot of theories to go deep diving in. Namor? aka marvel's version of aquaman but a little bit different showing up in the next black panther movie as the atlanteans okay so let's get ready to just dive deep in this video there's a lot of cool things i want to explore and it's going to be a long one this is just the beginning we might have to do a second part hello this is real t from the future and i just want to give a big thank you and credit to where credit is due to pig seed on reddit for making this iceberg on the mcu marvel universe it's been really fun researching and learning about so you are awesome keep it up the basis of an iceberg video by the way is that we have this giant glacier to cover and there's 10 percent of what people generally know about aka the stan lee cameos how he shows up in every movie maybe donald glover as the uncle of Ma Morales in the Spider-Man Homecoming movie, him making a little cameo in that. And then we have 90% of all this secret stuff that you might not know about. Cool random facts, level one. By the way, spoiler alert for everyone watching this video, um, be sure to watch the movies unless you just wanna know all the facts and how everything happens without watching it. Everything is connected. What this is talking about, by the way, is the MCU and how all the movies connect. With a little Wikipedia search, this is what we found. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, MCU, films are a series of American superhero films produced by Marvel Studios, based on characters that appeared in publications by Marvel Comics. The MCU is the shared universe in which all of the films are set. The films have been produced since 2007, and in the time Marvel Studio has proceeded to release 23 films, with at least 15 more in various stages of development. It is the highest grossing film franchise of all time, having grossed over 22.5 billion at the global box office. That is incredible, by the way. This includes Avengers Endgame, which became the highest grossing film of all time upon release. Legendary. Okay. Kevin Foggy has produced every film in the series along with Avi Arad for the first two releases. Gail Unheard for The Incredible Hulk, Amy Pascal for the Spider-Man films, Steven Broussard for Ant-Man and the Wasp, Jonathan Schwartz for Shang-Chi, in the legend of the 10 rings that's a new one that's going to be coming out soon and nate moore for eternal is also a new one it's going to come out within a few years the films are written and directed by a variety of individuals and features large often ensemble cast many of the actors including robert downey jr chris evans mark ruffalo chris hensworth scarlett johansson and jeremy renner signed contracts to star in numerous films Marvel Studio released its films in groups called Phases. Their first film is Iron Man 2008, which was distributed by Paramount Pictures. Paramount also distributed Iron Man 2 2010, Thor 2011, and Captain America The First Avenger 2011. While Universal Pictures distributed The Incredible Hulk in 2008, Walt Disney Studio Motion Pictures began distributing the series with the crossover film, The Avengers in 2012, one year later, which included phase one or concluded phase one. Then phase two began, Compromise of Iron Man 3, 2013, Thor, The Dark World, 2013, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, 2014, Guardians of the Galaxy, 2014, Avengers Age of Ultron 2015, which is basically Avengers 2, and Ant-Man 2015, and that was Phase 2. Then there was a finale, which was Captain America Civil War, and that is the first of the Phase 3. 
<laughs> I know, man. Marvel is so crazy intense with this. And that was followed by Doctor Strange 2016, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, 2017, Spider-Man Homecoming, 2017, Thor Ragnarok, 2017, Black Panther, 2018, Avengers Infinity War, 2018, Ant-Man and the Wasp, 2018, Captain Marvel 2019, Avengers Endgame 2019, and Spider-Man Far From Home 2019. The first three phases are collectively known as the Infinity Saga, and the Spider-Man films are owned and financed and distributed by Sony Pictures. And that is kind of where we are right now, but we are already ramping up for the next 15 movies. The next phase is called Phase 4, and you're already seeing, by the way, that Marvel are doing multiple movies every year. It only can be done by a top class of amazing artists and business owners that really have a plan and know through my new details on how things need to happen. And you're gonna see this later on in the video, the further we get, I'm gonna talk about how every director had their problems with the committee or the Disney committee and how some directors fell out and some directors stayed, but it was all in service of the film so that we could have something that us as the comic book fans or the average viewer fan would fall in love with and follow the story, which why I'm assuming you are watching right now because you're a Marvel fan or maybe you don't like it. I mean, that would be unfortunate, but I am. And so I'm making this really long video about it. Very educational. So phase four will include Black Widow 2021, Shang-Chi in the Legend of the Ten Rings 2021, Eternals 2021. Spider-Man No Way Home 2021, Doctor Strange in Multiverse of Madness 2022, Thor Love and Thunder 2022, Black Panther Wakanda Forever 2022, The Marvels 2022, <laughs> Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania 2023, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 2023, and Fantastic Four. The phase will feature these films as well as 12 announced television events, series, and one special for the streaming services Disney+. Plus. And one additional film for 2022 in Phase 4 and two additional films for 2023 are also in development. And that's how everything is connected so far. And that's a lot. You know what's funny? That unfortunately doesn't include shows like Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Netflix Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, The Defenders, The Punisher, Brando Bernathian, like oh my gosh, coming together, like those are great series, but they didn't make the official MCU cut. And it was probably because a lot of legal rights, uh, you know, removing the Marvel rights from Netflix onto Disney Plus, but also, you know, with series like, or the movie, Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness, we might see a reintroduction of these characters if they can get the money to buy them all out again. And I really love like Daredevil and The Punisher specifically. Those TV shows were just very good. And I was following it whenever it came out, I would just binge it all whenever it came out on Netflix. I remember those days. So yeah, is everything connected? It is so that's a quick run through of all the movies that happen and where we are right now and where the mcu is heading i give so much praise and like just goodwill to the people who have kept this running because like you just have to be a nerd you know what i mean you have to be not only that but you have to be a master at storytelling and bringing together like so many characters and just the fact that it's making a lot of money and it's doing well in the box office just kind of tells you that if you're a hater, like, I don't know, there's there's just so many spots they could have done it wrong. And I, I give it to them for like making at least most of the fans happy with the products. You know, I'm a cosplayer. I see these movies and I go out to convention and I see people dress up as these heroes. And I think that's very telling of like how much support Marvel gets from its fans and Marvel allowing their fan base to do that kind of thing and even being featured in their series. Okay, I was in one of those series, Marvel Becoming as a cosplayer. Like 
it shows that I think they know exactly what they're doing and Marvel is gonna be here to stay for quite a while. Link in the bio, by the way, if you wanna see that Marvel becoming series I was a part of as a Spider-Man cosplayer. So five year leap, basically at the end of Avengers Infinity War, Thanos snaps his finger and everything changes. Half of the entire universe in a single moment turn into dust, leaving Avengers like Black Widow, War Machine, Captain Marvel, Hulk, the Asgardians, and Hawkeye alone to deal with the aftermath, Iron Man as well. And it's the five year leap. What it means is that everybody died, but then they had to come back whenever Endgame happened. And these five years still passed, but everybody that died came back and they were like the same age of when they died. It, and that was it. It was just problem solved. Uh, but it was interesting because you would see characters that went through a lot of trauma. And so let's explore that for a little bit. Black Widow, for example, she's one of the heroes that was left. She refused to give up and kept looking for a way to bring everybody back. Iron Man, he gave up, but not really. He kind of reclused himself, got a little daughter. I love you 3000 and uh, you know, had a little happy life in a little cabin in the forest. War Machine became the cosmic Iron Patriot, still going on missions, saving whoever he can. Captain Marvel presumably became more well known on Earth. Professor Hulk was born, which I wish we could have seen more of. I really love the Hulk. Planet Hulk, that movie is like one of my favorites, seeing him go to Mars and do all kind of hectic stuff and coming back. I wish we could have saw Professor Hulk develop. You know, I, I know like the fight with Thanos really like, in the movies, they, you know, Banner says that like throughout him getting beat up by Thanos, he's learned to like control and, and have conversation with the Hulk where like they are now be able to be the Hulk and be Banner at the same time mentally. But like, it would have been cool to have a solo movie just about that because the Hulk is an incredible character. Um, the Asgardian refugee settled as new Asgard, that happened. Hawkeye sought a life of vengeance. He was fighting a lot of the, <laughs> I don't know why Asian mafia in the movies and I always thought that was weird, but they exist, right? Whatever. Um, <laughs> and yeah, man. And then all of a sudden everybody comes back after they time travel and stuff in the end game. We're slowly seeing how the world is so much different and it still has to deal with the p burden and trauma of those five years. So the five year leap, that's basically what happens. Everything ended, but then everything came back, but they're still dealing with the aftermath of everything ending. If you are watching WandaVision that just came out, it that's all it's about. Vision died and Wanda went off and made her own little village and brainwashed a bunch of people and became the Scarlet Witch because of all that trauma and PTSD and now Vision is like White Vision, or there's a version of him called White Vision out there with all the old memories. And the vision that Wanda came up with is dismantled or maybe in her mind or something like that. And I'm telling you this because you probably should watch WandaVision if you haven't already, but you know, maybe those little details are enough. That's basically what happened. <laughs> I'm not gonna dog on WandaVision in this YouTube video. This is a Marvel positive video. <laughs> but if you liked or didn't like WandaVision, leave a comment, let me know. Marvel Multiverse. The universe is only one of an infinite number. Worlds without end, some benevolent and life-giving, others filled with malice and hunger, dark places where powers older than time lie. Rivenous and waiting. <laughs> Who are you in this vast new multiverse, Mr. Strange? Said by the ancient one to Stephen Strange. <laughs> the multiverse is the collective term for all parallel dimensions in existence. Okay, I'm really excited because you see this in Endgame whenever they start time traveling back into the past and they change minute little detail. For example, one of the big things that happened and now it's his own TV show is Loki. Loki, instead of be going to jail and being like 
captured is released and if you didn't know in infinity wars Th loki is dead like he died with like thanos in some fight and so you know it's bringing this character back to life so similar to that maybe we'll see black widow come back to life we're already seeing gamora come back to life because of that so what also happened which changes up the universe completely because of time travel crap is that in endgame everybody comes back to the present but not only do they do that but thanos he comes back to the present that they're at. He time travels forward to fight them and he brings Gamora and Nebula with them. But these are the old Gamora, the old Nebula before they met the Guardians of the Galaxy. So they're evil and they're not good people. They haven't come to terms with Thanos being a terrible, terrible father to them. <laughs> and so we're seeing the difference between that. And whenever Thanos died at the end of the movie, you see uh, Star-Lord trying to like get Gamora back on his side and that's where I guess maybe the next Guardians of the Galaxy 3 volume will pick up uh, and it's just so, so interesting there's so many fun uh, stories to explore and I hope we get to see it all within these next few movies I assume we will but yeah that's what it's talking about the multiverse of madness and you we already know coming out soon is Doctor Strange multiverse of madness and we're seeing so many rumors about that already and I have a little theory here, and I'm going to include uh, this soon because I yeah, keep this video as fun and so I see. Spider-Man No Way Home, by the way, that's the new Spider-Man movie coming out. The third installment of this Tom Holland Spider-Man is rumored that, you know, maybe Andrew Garfield, Tobey Maguire, all these old school villains too, from the Green Goblin, Venom even, Dr. Octavius, from the Tobey Maguire verse, by the way, they are rumored to show up. So I'm just throwing this out there. It hasn't come out yet, but when it does come out, what if the final 10 minutes of the movie, it's called No Way Back because Tom Holland gets stuck in the multiverse and it starts to introduce the Spider-Verse. And in this Spider-Verse, it's not only the other tellings of Spider-Man, but it's the Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse movie, which was about the Spider-Verse basically, by the way, it's Tobey Maguire, it's Andrew Garfield, and it's Tom Holland all coming together. And then in the multiverse of madness, Doctor Strange gets in contact and because he needs Tom Holland back. Huh? Huh? What do you think? Get educated, link in the bio for more multiverse facts and Marvel cinematic fan things to know. Rodney and Banner recast. So throughout the years that the Marvel verse have been releasing their movies, the MCU, they have been recast for a few characters. The biggest ones are Rodney and Banner recast. And Rodney is War Machine. Banner is the Hulk. And these actors were just replaced and there wasn't much fuss about it. People weren't mad or anything, but we're curious. We want to know the drama. We want to know the tea. What exactly happened? So this is what the internet has to say about it. <laughs> the first big recasting in the MCU happened after actor Terrence Howard did not return to play his part as Tony Stark's BFF, James Rhodes, aka War Machine. A role he originated in the much beloved original Iron Man film. Supposedly, Howard was the highest paid actor in Iron Man and for some reason unknown, Marvel didn't want to give him a pay bump for Iron Man 2. So he was replaced with Don Cheadle, who was played him in the every MCU film since. Although Cheadle has done a fine job, this one was initially jarring as the two actors do not remotely resemble one another, which is true. They carry each themselves differently, but I guess everything really led up to a money thing, which is unfortunate. But let's see what happened to the Hulk. Probably the second biggest casting change was with core Avenger Bruce Banner, AKA the Hulk, originally played by Edward Norton in 2008's The Incredible Hulk. The film somewhat underperformed, at least by today's Marvel standard. People seem to genuinely like Norton's portrayal of Banner, but apparently he's the kind of actor who takes a lot of creative control over his character and we all know that at marvel studio boss kevin foggy is the last word on everything coupled with the so-so response of the incredible hulk and you can see why foggy 
replaced Norton with Mark Ruffalo. Though, with the Multiverse of Madness, who's to say that we're just watching a different universe in the MCU with these different actors? They are all canon, or they could be. <laughs> At least that's what I'd like to say or think about it. Um, and I remember watching lots of great YouTube videos and article breakdowns about this. And specifically with the Hulk, it, it really was based on Edward Norton wanting to bring out something new in the Hulk that could be really explored mentally and uh, psychologically, which we don't really get to see as much. It's very much glazed over in the new Marvel movies. Like, why didn't we get to see Professor Hulk? I'm really serious. I would love to see a solo Hulk movie, but it probably won't happen unless they announce it. And uh, I think the poor performance, they just want a movie to make some money, right? Uh, which is unfortunate. So it is what it is. There's a really good looper video though that explores that. Link in the bio if you want to watch it. Stand the watcher. Hey fellas. Hey wait, where are you going? <laughs> hey, you were supposed to be my lift home. <laughs> How will I get out of here? Hey, oh gee, I've got so many more stories to tell. Oh gee, oh guys, oh gee. Watchers informant to the watchers. <laughs> The Watcher Informant is a being who travels the universe and reports on his adventures to the Watchers. He frequently visits Earth on various occasions dating as far back as 1943 until at least 2018 in other planets as Xandar and Sakaar in 2014 and 2017 respectively. And so this kind of idea or theory is about Stan Lee being a Watcher and that's why he shows up in so many random scenes throughout the Marvel Cinematic Universe just randomly and says his little thwip and shows up in the film. Now we all know he's like the founder of both of these heroes as a comic book legend and writer, iconic and fun loving guy, right? I am a big fan of this theory. Artists like to wittily think up ways they can put themselves into their own artwork and I think this is a great idea. I met the dude by the way back in the day rest in peace to one of my biggest heroes we also talked about this in my spider-man movie video where i deep dived into this everything spider-man so be sure to check that out link in the bio by the way but yeah i did meet stanley got a little thing right over there you can see it yeah that's that's me and stan it really is one of those things that is unfortunate because like i wish or i hope we see him and new installments and then later movies just popping up as the watcher again and just having his little quip and saying a stan lee line that's really funny but he didn't show up in wandavision he didn't show up in the falcon and the winter soldier so it might not happen craglin is rocket at this point, most Marvel fans of the cinematic Marvel Universe know that Sean Gunn does double duty in the franchise. He plays both Ravager, named Craglin, in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies directed by his brother James Gunn, but he also handles the on-set work for the digital creation that is Rocket the Raccoon. Fun facts, right? So this is basically talking about James Gunn is the director of Guardians of the Galaxy. He's done one, two, and now Guardians of the Galaxy three. And his brother, Sean Gunn, who is also an actor, they grew up together. They did all these movies and stuff together. And so his brother does the role of Rocket the Raccoon, at least the animatronics or the, you know, morph suit. I got a picture right here. You can see acting as Rocket the Raccoon. And, but he's also a character of Kraglin in the, Gardens of the Galaxy movies. And so they are one and the same, theoretically. And just to explore this a little more, because I'm a big fan of James Gunn, uh, I wanna talk about the movie that came before Gardens of the Galaxy, which if you go back even further is Troma Production, which is where James Gunn like started his journey as a filmmaker. But after that, he made this movie with Rain Wilson. And if you remember, he's the actor from the office used Dwight, but it's called Super and it features him and Alan, Ellen Page being like fake superheroes. And 
This isn't the first time James Gunn tackled the superhero niche, by the way. He did a whole series similar like to a household of like a Avengers type heroes hanging out. But this is like his a feature film featuring that his brother Sean Gunn shows up too. It even features Nathan Fillion, Kevin Bacon. It's so fun. I highly recommend it. If you love Guardians of the Galaxy, you can watch Super and know why I was so excited when they announced James Gunn to be the director of that film because I was a big fan of Super. In fact, I remember back in the day, I, I looked all over the internet to try to find the script for Super. I couldn't ever find it because I wanted to learn like James Gunn writing style so I could learn how to write scripts and movies and go down that path too, which I did for a good minute. <laughs> I mean, I wrote this script, right? It was so much researching. Yeah, but go watch that movie, Super. It's great stuff. James Gunn, yo, so much praise to him and his brother. They're doing great work in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Thanos theory. This is a theory about the Infinity Stones, seen or unseen in the MCUs, and it spells out Thanos, the Mad Titan, who will be the main villain in Avengers Infinity War and Avengers 4. The stone was used by Loki to summon the Chitauri to invade Earth, but was later defeated by the Avengers. Thanos' goal is to eliminate all the lives in the universe using the stone's incredible power. But he doesn't do that for some reason. Thanos believes that the only way to save the universe is to thin out the life in it, to eliminate conflict for resources that would otherwise lead to death and suffering because of his childhood trauma, basically. His home planet being malnourished and not having good outcomes. To explain even further, I have a picture here with the one, two, three, four, five, six Infinity Stones Tesseract stands for T, Hydra, H, Aether, A, Necklace, N, Orb, O, Scepter, S, spelling out Thanos. Could it be? I don't know. I mean, the stones are named Space, Soul, Reality, Time, Power, and Mind. I think it's a fun theory. Thanos, I wouldn't be surprised if Marvel planned this out beforehand too, by the way with all the movies they made, it makes sense that they did plan it out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> is it a stretch? It is a stretch, but for Marvel, it's nothing. Let's be serious here. I love Thanos, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned it, but in Marvel Infinity Wars, this version of Thanos is such a wise and mature entity. You know, I want to focus on an aspect that I haven't heard much people talk about, but in the movie Infinity War, he's not particularly in a rush to do everything. Like, I mean, yes, he's going out there and just doing it one by one, but it's not like he's running. It's not like he's looking at the clock. He kind of lets fate guide his decision. And you see this because he sacrificed Gamora. It's just a long scene. It doesn't feel rushed. It feels patient even. Like Thanos has been waiting for centuries for this. In fact, when he was teasered at the end of the Avengers filmed every time, he's sitting and just waiting for the Avengers to do everything and bring the stones to him basically. And so what I love is that whenever he goes on the planet to fight Iron Man and Spider-Man and all of them, he gives them a fighting chance to stop him. He really does. You know, and if it wasn't for Star-Lord, maybe he would have got away with it. He wouldn't have gotten away with snapping all of humanity. But even then, like, I think even if Star-Lord didn't punch him, he would have just like snapped his fan back because he's already all powerful. And then he went to Earth after he got the stones and the information he needed to get Vision's Infinity Stone. But if you notice that whole fight, like Thanos isn't even like really feeling the effect of anything. He's just like, yeah, y'all are nothing to me. Like if fate wants you to defeat me right here, right now, then do it. Then stop me right now. And they couldn't. And so he was like, it's destiny. I am inevitable. This decision has to be made because you can't beat me. So I must be right. And I think that's really interesting because he gave them a chance. And I think as a villain, that's something that it's so cynical in a way. It's just mastermind level of stuff. You know, it's like, I can't be wrong if you try to teach me a lesson and it just doesn't go right. So yeah, I wanted to focus on that. <laughs> with that, we're done with level one though.
I just want to point out, I don't know if Thanos gets enough love on the internet for specific reasons, but I really think that's one of the reasons why he's a kind of an honorable villain, especially how he gets killed by Thor later and just kind of takes it like, yeah, man, i made my choice. I did my thing. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it was like he waited his whole life for that moment. Dang, it was baller kind of. <laughs> Anyway, what do you guys think? Leave a comment. Level two MCU timeline error. So at the end of Avengers Endgame, or kind of in the middle of it, they travel back in time, the Avengers, to pick up all the Infinity Stones again so that they can re-snap the fingers and change the fate of everything. But there might have been some errors with the films themselves about what happened in those histories. So let's see what marvel has to say about that marvel has released an official mcu timeline it's just a shame that it's still broken over the past 10 years marvel studios has crafted an unprecedented shared universe with 20 films and multiple less connected tv shows that tie in the comics telling an epic and intimate story of avengers guardians titans and giant ants it's a masterful patchwork of cinematic storytelling as long as you don't look too closely while the mcu movies flow fairly well into each other spider-man homecoming black panther and ant-man and the wasp all are directly influenced by captain america civil war for example if you try to construct a cohesive timeline of the films it gets a bit tricky it used to be that marvel movies were set in the year they released period adventure captain america the first avenger notwithstanding however as events stacked movies released years apart are said to happen around the same time in making this change though marvel didn't make any major considerations for say a 2018 blockbuster being set in 2016 because of that clear flow in bevy of wider reaching easter eggs slowly the mcu timeline began to on a micro obsessive sense not make sense okay so i was actually wrong it's not about avengers endgame and all those details it's actually about the release dates and how all these different movies come out like two every year or three every year and how they are set during different times and how they conflict and it doesn't make sense with the timeline and in the state of the the movies in the metaverse of like reality like the year that they're supposed to come out so i think that's really interesting in fact um man timeline errors it's real <laughs> simplifying it this picture up here is like thanos has been in my head for six years since he sent that army back for to new york and now he's back <laughs> and uh everything actually happened eight years later because that's when the movie was released so it's little things like that which i guess it's really hard to help especially when you have a crazy schedule like that and you have to finish and make these movies and make them good and hit the like date of release because it's weighing on like 15 plus movies in the future crazy iron man was mostly improv Huh. Robert Downey Jr. changed the Marvel Cinematic Universe forever by improvising that line in Iron Man. I am Iron Man. Yeah, there's a lot of moments in these films where things are improv and they kind of work and they make the film better and it's like organic. It's a lot of that yes and if you're into improv um, as an actor. And, you know, you see it done masterfully by people who are just professional in the industry. And I love it, man. There's gonna be a whole compilation videos of these moments, link in the bio if you wanna watch it. Cap's different list. Steve Rogers' notebook was a notebook that contained a list of items, people, and events which Steve Rogers made notes of in order to become better acquainted with the modern world. The book was later given to Bucky Barnes as a way to help him cope with his time as a winter soldier, creating a list of amends. And i think it's cool to see the relationship of cap's book now bucky barnes if you watch the winter soldier and the falcon the series that just came out on disney plus you see him dealing with that notebook and making his own list of events to become anti-hero into hero and that journey of him making that 
you know, reamending all the bad things he's done in the past because of brainwashing and Hydra stuff. And so it's basically the good heart of like Steve Rogers and his friendship. And he's like giving it to Bucky and being like, hey man, here, have this, you know, live a good life, you know, make amends, be a good hero. <laughs> yeah. Coulson becomes Vision. So the theory here is that whenever Loki stabbed Agent Coulson that one time in that one movie, <laughs> it copied the brainwaves of Agent Coulson or his mind so that whenever Vision was born with the Mind Stone, Coulson's brainwaves entered that Vision psyche. And although he doesn't know it, he was birthed and given the likeness of Agent Coulson. And that's why they kind of have similar visual aspects to him. And, you know, it wasn't Ultron. He wasn't Jarvis. Only thing he knew he was, was maybe Agent Coulson. This is a theory, by the way. It's not canon. Uh, you know, the, you know, if you really go by the movies, it, it could make sense. Um, but yeah, I honestly, I think it would explain maybe why Vision is a good person, like a hero, instead of like just kind of like anti-hero, kind of doesn't know right from wrong because of robot logic. Could Agent Coulson be the birth of Vision? And does that mean that Wanda or the Scarlet Witch is dating a, whoa, assimilated version of Agent Coulson? Lengthy contracts, every single actor who gets signed up for the Marvel movies have to sign contracts that last for decades or years and multiple movies. And this is all set to a certain amount of money, set to hours being very flexible. It basically becomes your life for like five to 10 years forthcoming if you sign a contract with Marvel with your character and hero and you have to be there at events and do things for them. It makes sense. This is the life of an actor if you're gonna be a part of these projects. And so if you're the star, it's just coming for you. You know, I think Robert Downey Jr. has had it. Tom Holland has had it. All the actors, they had to deal with it. <laughs> That's the basics of this one. Woo! Level three, Namor in Endgame. So if you don't know who Namor is, by the way, he is the Atlantean like fighter he's kind of like aquaman for from dc but for the marvel universe here's what the internet has to say when the avengers endgame opened up in theaters hardcore mcu fans were sure that the reference namor the submariner though it wasn't confirmed at the time the character is basically aquaman in of marvel comics he rules the seven seas and was intru introduced all the way back in 1939. But who is Namor in Black Panther 2? Namor, the submariner, is the king of Atlantis and Marvel Universe. And the rumor of sea divers from Wakanda will supposedly spark a war between the Wakandans and the Atlantean society. Fandom Wire also published another rumor about Doctor Doom being the cause of this war. You know, if all that stuff really pops out in Black Panther 2, I'm stoked for it. I'm excited. You know, I did not even think about the thought of Atlanteans and Wakandans, but it makes sense. It's a really great plot thread. And if they attach Doctor Doom to that too, which kind of like slowly unveils the Fantastic Four, and uh kind of everything connecting oh uh, man that would be so great and then we get another great hero namor introduced to the spotlight that we need you know i mean i'll be honest personally i don't know too much about namor and his relationship with everything but hopefully these movies flesh them out in a way to where we can learn to love these characters and see their stories brought to light wakanda's first appearance when was Wakanda's first announced in the MCU universe? The country was mentioned and mispronounced in 2015's Avengers Age of Ultron. But Wakanda truly stepped out of hiding for the first time in 2016's Captain America Civil War, in which Chadwick Bosman made 
his Black Panther debut. Rest in peace to Chadwick Boseman, by the way. He's a big hero. I have a Black Panther helmet like right behind me, by the way. Let me grab it for you. We're already talking about Black Panther so much. I love the movies, you can tell. Got this little helmet, it fits on my head. I, I cosplay him from time to time. But yeah, one of my heroes, Chadwick Boseman, and uh, the movies are amazing. Love it. And yeah, cool fact, you know, when did Wakanda first come out? Peter Parker in Iron Man 2. So there's this moment in Iron Man 2 where this kid with an Iron Man mask brings up his hand and tries to shoot a hammer drone that's about to kill him. And luckily enough, at that very moment, Iron Man comes swooping in and saves the kid's life and takes down the drone. People had a big fan theory whether this was Peter Parker or not, who would later become Spider-Man, and this was like his first introduction to the universe because he's it's the right age, so where like he would grow up to be like a younger Spider-Man in high school, and it's actually confirmed. Confirmed. That's the funniest thing. Uh, Tom Holland had an interview online with uh, Kevin Foggy, and they tell they had a conversation they were like yeah that was peter parker that kid with the iron man mask who was brave enough to you know fight the hammer drone so this is one of the times where like a fan theory came true and then we were like oh crap so if you want to see that scene by the way it's a good flashback on to just how far the mcu has come a link in the bio of that clip from when iron man saves peter parker's life before he was ever spider-man Edgar Wright Ant-Man. If you guys didn't know, originally the Ant-Man movie was supposed to be directed by Edgar Wright. I remember this happening because I was really excited for it because it's like, oh my gosh, all the visual cool gags that Ant-Man's gonna have and the comedic timing of Edgar Wright would fit perfectly. This ended up not working out and the movie was directed by Peyton Reed. But wanna know why that happened? Let's see what the internet has to say about that. <laughs> Edgar Wright departed Ant-Man in 2014 after being with the project through its development process. This made way for director Peyton Reed to take the helm of the burgeoning franchise while Wright was still credited as the screenwriter for the origin story. And basically what happened was once again, the Disney creative team, uh, I think they had a lot of problems with the way Edgar Wright was telling a story and they wanted to suggest and change a lot of things and that can only happen so many times before Edgar Wright at the end of the day had to you know decide to take a step back and take a different path because he wanted to tell his story of the Ant-Man and not have that change in such a big way to where it wouldn't be his authentic style anymore which is I think what makes him special as director he was willing to say no so because of his art and the way he wanted to tell his story and he didn't let other people change that but because of that he couldn't be a part of the mcu universe but who knows there are rumors of him returning to do one of the series on disney plus or one of the movies so we don't know if this is the end it wasn't a bad cutoff by the way it was just like an understandable creative difference and he is still credited as part of the origins of the story for the Ant-Man film. So there is hope. So fingers crossed, right? I would love to see him direct one of the new Marvel series. Spider-Man, Ma Morales in Homecoming. I was excited when this happened. I think you guys all remember it too if you watched Spider-Man Homecoming and Donald Glover walks out being the character that is the uncle of Ma Morales aka aaron davis who is also the prowler and he has a conversation with peter parker who is dressed up in superman and they're by this car and he gives some tips and advice to peter parker in this scene so as the internet would say we've known for months now that ma morales the black uh, puerto rican spider-man who debuted it in the page of the ultimate spider-man comics exists in the marvel cinematic universe it started with aaron davis aka the prowler as played by donald glover in spider-man homecoming so this is a little theory i've come up with because of everything happening in spider-man no way home which is the spider-man 3 coming out i haven't seen this online it probably exists already leave a comment if you have seen it because it's spider-man no way home and this tom holland version of spider-man gets stuck in the multiverse where he has to adventure with the spider-verse if 
the MCU universe that we're currently in doesn't have a Spider-Man, he is proclaimed dead, who's gonna take up his spot? It can only be Mal Morales. And so one of those secret movies that they haven't announced with, because of the hype that, you know, is, you know, I talked about it earlier, there's like one secret movie and like two secret TV series or something like that, has to be Mal Morales Spider-Man film where Peter Parker is stuck in the multiverse, so he's announced dead, and maybe he has a clash with the Green Goblin or something because of the multiverse, and Green Goblin grabs him and brings him <laughs> to you know the multiverse, and he's no longer exists in this MCU universe for now anyway. We have a little more Mal Morales being like, "Yo, Peter Parker's gone, but like, you know, I have the same abilities. I got." bit by the same Oscorp spider or similar to that and I can do the web thing and everything and I know my stuff and he takes up the mantle for Spider-Man while Peter Parker is gone and then when Peter Parker comes back he is introduced to Mob Morales who's wearing a suit and is doing the, his thing and now Peter Parker can do what Iron Man did for him and teach Mob Morales how with great power comes great responsibility because we gotta remember in this mcu universe uncle ben played a different type of role to this peter parker which i think personally is okay because we've seen the same story a lot of times and this is a, another interesting take and it makes sense for this specific universe little changes make it fun to watch the series because you don't really know exactly how things are gonna play out. But that's only a theory, a fan theory. <laughs> um, let me know, man. I, I I hope it happens. It would be so cool. <laughs> it has to happen, let's be honest. So much money, this is why I really think it's gonna be happening. So much money is to be made if they make this Mal Morales movies because suit costume cosplayers are gonna go crazy about it. They already released Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse and people love that version of Mal Morales. It was a great hit. So yeah, man, let's make it happen. <laughs> or let's wait to see if it happens. <laughs> Joe Costa. Will Joe Costa be in the MCU? And if you don't know who Joe Costa is, Joe Costa is a robot created by Ultron in the comics who eventually turns against her creator to be a hero. And she even served as an Avenger in the comics. However, Tony chooses Friday instead. And it could mean Joe Costa is never booted up in this MCU. And so, uh, there's a picture here and it kind of shows like the different minds or the different boots of I guess the mental systems and of Iron Man's creation and you have Friday and Joe Costa and he chose Friday in this MCU but who's to say that Joe Costa won't show up because it's canon that she exists that robotic interface and so who knows man anything is possible would love to see it new anchor in cairo so what this is talking about is in captain america 2 there's an agent jasper sitwell uh the tv anchor in cairo is most likely a reference to the foreshadowing of mark specter's moon knight who is a marvel hero that doesn't exist in the mcu yet the high school valedictorian from iowa city could just be a random genius kid who might do something opposed to Hydra and become the Moon Knight. Now, wouldn't that be cool? And actually, I just wanna say, within the time span of me writing this and editing, they have released like a teaser of the Moon Knight movie that's coming out. So the Moon Knight's happening, period. And if you don't know the Moon Knight, he's basically Batman for the Marvel Universe. Um, let me tell you a little bit about his character. Struggling with multiple personalities and immoral inclinations, Mark Spector fights on against all odds as he's cloaked Avenger Moon Knight. He is a vigilante who was granted powers from an Egyptian god, Moon God Khan Shu, who offered him a second chance at life in exchange for becoming his avatar on Earth. As a result, Spector was resurrected and given superhuman abilities and has been a member of the Avengers, the Defenders, and the Midnight Suns throughout the comic books and animated series. So let's get hyped for it. Uh, I know my middle brother, Tin, he loves the Moon Knight. 
and he's excited for this to happen <laughs> and so yeah man let the hype begin what do you guys think about the moon knight are you guys excited to have it in officially in the marvel universe what do you think will happen to this character scott any theories leave a comment down below close call casting throughout the marvel cinematic universe there have been recastings there have been auditions there have been so many things to find the perfect character that can really bring this hero to life and they're really super focused on picking that right person even to the point where they'll replace it they don't feel like it's right which we saw with the hulk and the war machine in some cases where this happened is gamora where originally they almost casted amanda Seyfried, but ended up choosing zoe saldana also steve rogers captain america they almost chose john krasinski but ended up going with chris evans and most importantly iron man was robert Downey jr but it could have been tom cruise which that would have been such a different story he would have played it completely different too um i respect them for being able to take a chance on robert Downey jr and having the amazing multiverse we do have if you guys are interested there's marvel audition tapes in the link in the bio to watch chef is about marvel what this is talking about is a film called chef written directing and starring john favreau let me tell you a little bit more the internet says john favreau 2014 film chef may not be directly based on a true story but it remains an immensely personal film for the director to the extent it is natural to wonder how much is based on his real life and how much i'm adding this part by the way how much his experience with the marvel universe the actors from that universe or the real Hollywood industry and the stories he's learned from Kevin Foggy and directing and, and writing and being an actor in these amazing masterpiece series has influenced Chef. That's what they're talking about here. You could dig more into it, but let's just go on to the next one. Mr. Harrington is in The Incredible Hulk. So there's this very specific scene or this character, basically the computer nerd pizza guy in the incredible hulk and he talks to bruce banner who was then edward norton not oh man so many names mark ruffalo yes mark ruffalo man okay man this is so education for me i'm getting to connect so many different things so basically in the scene he talks to edward norton and he's like yo want a pizza slice to come chill and hang out and they're like yeah yeah and they go and eat a pizza but this same nerdy weird dude ends up growing up and staying in the marvel universe and this is how we know it's connected to that original movie by the way that you know the incredible hulk is connected to the mcu because this character becomes peter parker's teacher mr harrington the one who like teaches him and also takes them to the trip overseas in spider-man far from home so that's a cool connection man way to keep everything locked in and in the timeline the actor, by the way, is Martin Starr, who plays Mr. Harrington. Um, it's cool to see him continue this role from that dude back then, Incredible Hulk, all the way to Spider-Man Far From Home and to the future. I have a clip of that pizza scene from the Incredible Hulk in the link in the bio if you want to see it. All right, so we're ending part one here. I just had to take a break. It's um, There's like over 50 pages that I wrote up and had to research for this whole thing just so you know and it's been a lot of work i've kind of been coughing because it's a lot to say and I'm, I'm still like trying to pronunciate and dictate things right for you guys so thank you if you've gotten this far please support and like the channel links in the bio if you can it helps me keep making videos like every like or every comment or every subscribe i hope you know it really does count because it not only does it recommend my channel to the algorithm for this specific kind of video, but it also tells other people that watch those videos that they can watch the videos I'm making here and get these iceberg videos or these, you know, theory videos out. And I, I really do enjoy making them. They're so educational. But yeah, my voice is getting worn out for the day. So, you know, it may be later. If I can, I'll try to shoot part two, but it's a lot of editing I have to put in as well so if you liked it please like please love comment um you guys are amazing yeah um 
see my you can tell my brain is like fried right now from all the information dumping i had to give you guys but uh <laughs> yeah uh stop hate make love anybody can be a hero and i'll see you guys soon you know part two i'll either link it in the bio if it's not already out by the time you're watching it and um yeah this was fun roti signing out